realistically in 10 years? Where, where might we be with transition towns in, in South East Queensland anyway? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there's about uh, 10 initiatives in Brisbane at the moment. They all tend to be fairly uh, inner city. Well, there is one over at the, the Fernie Grove. So at, uh, in 10 years' time, I want to see basically Brisbane blanketed by the transition initiatives. And at the moment, they tend to be um, one per ward. But it'd be nice to break that down e- even further so that um, you know, there's all the footpaths are being transformed into fruit tree groves looked and uh, being maintained by people uh, who are actually earning a living out of that sort of a thing. Um, the the train stations and the, the bus stops, instead of having multi or single use um, park and ride facilities, uh, all the, the bicycle parking is has taken over and it's actually a lot closer. So people are actually doing those rides to the to the public transport mm-hmm. rather than actually driving there. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And so what might get in the way of that kind of outcome, do you think? Um, more what, are you, what are you struggling with? <laughs> yeah, uh, time. It's, it's one of those things that people are actually very busy mm-hmm. with their time mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, debt is an issue as well. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to do a lot more, but the, the old debt cycle has been locked in, into place. And it's, I suppose as well, it's, the, um, it's getting through those unexamined assumptions of, yeah, we need to have economic growth. Um, as a mathematician by uh, qualification, um, I know that you can't have exponential growth in a, in a closed system. So that sort of thinking, the, the consumption cycle, um, and even down the track of the, the financial economic crisis keeps on going on, that's going to maybe shut up shop a little bit. So, you know, the the money that needs to be spent um, on infrastructure won't be spent because they're too busy bailing out other things. So, mm-hmm. there's some of the, I suppose, the um, the possibilities that, that could stop it from going further forward. Okay, thank you. It's a nice segue, actually. Thanks for <laughs> mentioning the word consumption cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Anderson, this seems like a natural time uh, to move the conversation to another social movement that's building up ahead of steam, and that's collaborative consumption. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? So collaborative consumption is essentially the definition for this this kind of reinvention of really really old market behaviours, essentially. Things like bartering, swapping, trading, exchanging, behaviours that we were quite familiar with, you know, generations ago or centuries ago, but have really lost favour over the last few decades as we became focused on our hyper-consumption culture and suddenly, you know, ownership was about status and and that sort of accumulation of stuff. But what we're seeing now is that uh, peer-to-peer technologies and things technology capacity is allowing us to to sort of have a bigger handle on what assets we do have and also assist us to to share and barter and trade and exchange in ways that we would never have been able to do even 10 years ago, realistically. So how are people getting involved in that? What are they actually doing on the ground? It's, it's fa- I mean, it's fascinating because when... So I work with Rachel Botsman, who wrote the book about the movement, and what she saw when she started working on this is sort of nothing compared to what we've seen in the last six to 12 months, the growth in the area. So we've seen, you know, we, we often hear that car sharing is the gateway drug into collaborative consumption because it's it's kind of an easy way to, to transition into it. People are joining car sharing platforms such as Go Get Car Share, which almost existed in Brisbane but um, doesn't at the moment. Um, but it's basically where there's a fleet of cars parked around the city in certain places and people have access using a membership card to, to swipe onto the car and get in and drive it and and just pay by the hour. So once people are familiarised with that kind of concept, perhaps I don't need a car, I can just use it for the trips where it makes sense. And then we're starting to see them enter into other spaces, whether it's um, clothes swapping, uh, peer-to-peer accommodation is probably one of the, the fastest growing examples. Platforms such as Airbnb, which um, is based in San Francisco, is a platform of um, a peer-to-peer marketplace of unique spaces around the world. So when people travel, instead of booking a hotel room, they can actually stay in, you know, somebody's cool apartment in Paris or, you know, a, a castle in Scotland if it takes you fancy. There's just a plethora of of accommodation available on this website, and people are becoming more comfortable with that idea of staying with somebody or perhaps staying in somebody's house, with which giving that more unique experience that you don't 
don't get when you're in a hotel in the tourist part of town. You know, it's unlocking doors to parts of the city that you wouldn't normally kind of have access to. So this kind of evolution into basically anything and everything, whether it's physical, tangible assets like tools or furniture or clothes, to more intangible assets such as time, skills and space, we're actually seeing this whole new market uh, being created. Tell me a little bit more about um, the tools issue, for example. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a great website called Neighbour go- uh, Neighbor Goods, Neighbor Goods yep. um, which seems to be largely in the US. It are is, we yes. seeing that kind of thing happening here yet? Yes, we are. There's a platform called Rentoid, which was started by a Melbourne-based entrepreneur called Steve Sammartino, and basically it is a place for you to list. If you looked around your house, basically you would see things that you pick up once or twice a month if that. And, you know, if anybody's seen Rachel's TED Talk, you'll know that the the average drill is used 12 to 13 minutes in its entire lifetime. And probably half the people in this room, if not more, have one sitting in their in their garage in case they have one of those DIY moments coming on. But what we're seeing is that you can actually take all of these assets and, you know, who would know if the person right next door to you has exactly what you need at that point in time or vice versa. And these sites are allowing you to pull all this stuff online without moving it physically and giving people the opportunity to search for what's available in their local area. And, you know, the worst thing I could do for my productivity would be to buy some sort of gaming system like a PlayStation. But sometimes I just really feel the need, you know, and I think if I can just rent somebody's for like the weekend, I'd probably be okay. And then I'd probably never want to see it again. So this is the kind of thing we're actually starting to see um, become a lot more possible. And Facebook and and mechanisms like that are going to presumably support that support process. That That's process. right, because I think something like Facebook, you know, they wouldn't have known it when they started it, but it's basically created this automatic login process that gives you access to the systems, but what it also does is use your existing social networks and tells you who in your kind of close or second or third degree circles might have what you need. So it's not always about renting to strangers. It's actually people that are in your kind of social network and and when that's tapped into, people are much more comfortable and then suddenly the social network grows because (coughs) it's not about renting to your friends. It's about people who are within the Airbnb community or the Rentoid community. They all become part of that social network, definitely. And so what's the long-term potential, do you think? I think the long-term potential is amazing. I think what we'll start to see is... The line between what's shareable and what's not will become more and more clear. I think there's always going to be things that we need in our houses that are personal items or that are used on such a high rotation that there's no point making them shareable. But what we'll see is the the things that can be shared, we, we just are sick of owning stuff to be honest, we are moving towards this place where we would rather have access to the things we need when we need it without having to actually own that object outright. And I think companies will start to see that they could provide more of a rental-based approach to to lots of the things, so car sharing being an example of that. You just want to borrow the car when you need it and you don't have to pay for all the maintenance and costs like that. And for all the things that we do need regularly, companies are actually going to start moving back to that idea that they can have a longer relationship with us if they're looking at how to upgrade, modify, uh, replenish, improve objects rather than this obsolescence model that we've been operating on for so long. So things will be fixed and updated. You know, if you'd bought every iPod since, you know, they came out, you'd probably have like 18 iPods. And that's, I do. You do? Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> and are you sharing that? Maybe you should. <laughs> but, the, you know, that, that idea is that that cycle that we're in is, is quite crazy to think, you know, it's this exponential growth idea. We cannot possibly own every iPod because, you know, something's got to give somewhere. Um, or what do you do with those old iPods when you, when you don't need them anymore? And I think that's the, we're going to see that division and, and the, the networks and the support that allow this, this sharing of stuff to be so frictionless that we don't even think twice about it. That's, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, you can see really the examples of, of the selling the service rather than the product in things like a mobile phone where yep. basically companies are giving away the handset for nothing exactly. and just selling the hours that mm. you're on the phone or mm. the amount of data that you're downloading. That's right. Yep. Um, car sharing, of course, is another mm-hmm. example that you mm-hmm. mentioned. Yeah. Um, I understand there's even a, a company in the in the US that is um, renting carpet. So rather than you interface. having to yeah, yeah. interface things, rather yeah. than you having to buy your own carpet, they're in Australia they're, as well. Are they? Are they as mm. well? And yeah. it's it's really interesting because they've got this model where they have you sell you buy the tiles basically, and they'll be used often in in big corporate jobs as well. But um, they actually take the carpet back, and yeah, they use, all the products that are used to make that carpet are then recycled mm. into the next carpet so it's that cradle to cradle idea as well which is brilliant yeah, yeah. which does as you say get rid of the planned obsolescence but yeah. also presumably gives them a much 
greater better contract. incentive yeah. to make good product in the yeah. first place yeah. if, if they're actually exactly. hanging onto it themselves and not having to or, to dispose of it or to dis- to, yeah that's right well, well in fact having to dispose of it because of course if they're taking it back from you yeah then they're well, going they to be more interested yeah. in recycling that's right yeah. and so on and to, to prove that point in terms of going back to the car sharing idea the fact that this is gaining the attentions of the bigger brands a company like well in the last six to twelve months we've seen BMW, Daimler, Peugeot and Volkswagen all enter the car sharing space in their own right. So BMW has a scheme in Munich called Drive Now, which is possibly the coolest car sharing system around the world because basically you don't even have to book the car, you just walk up to it and you've converted your driver's licence into a membership card with a little microchip. You swipe the car that's closest to you because you've got it on your phone, you know, where you are and where the car is. Then you just drive it away and you can return it wherever you feel like returning it and you're only going to be charged by the minute rather than needing this kind of hour by hour booking system and that makes a lot of sense commercially and you know for for the user so and when you have a look at that flow on system as to how buildings are actually planned say high rise not needing as many car parks exactly Mm. that's right and and we're starting to see developments planning for car share spaces rather than a car park for every unit definitely Mm. yeah Mm. There's a similar principle emerging in mass collaboration um, like, uh, like Wikipedia, mm-hmm. for example, which I understand has similar levels now uh, of accuracy as, as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Britannica. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the other creative ways that people are collaborating that yeah. you see? Oh, I think, you know, the, 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 pop, the possibility of collaboration is just out of control. You know, there's so many ways for people to sort of meet and integrate online and create new products. We're seeing people, you know, coming up with new ideas for these systems simply by by being the users. You know, they can they can give feedback in real time via Twitter and Facebook and things like that and actually be involved in, you know, what's needed and what, what do we want to see. So I think that's really interesting as well. And how do you think Queensland might be different as as, as a as a former Queenslander. <laughs> oh, <sh. laughs> An expat Queenslander. Well, well yes, so I've, I've been in Sydney for four years, but before I um, moved there, I think Brisbane was in an interesting time. You know, the thing that was sad for me, I was a gee whiz car share member uh, back in 2007 when um, it launched here and Emma Rose then sold it to Go Get, but the council wouldn't support uh, gee whiz with car spaces and instead, obviously, they've invested in the bike sharing scheme, which is great, but I think for a city like Brisbane, with its climate and terrain, that actually is a very... If, if there's no cycling culture to begin with, um, that's a very challenging thing to integrate. And I think I think car sharing made a lot more sense to start with because we're, what we're talking about is reducing the number of cars owned and, and really uh, decreasing that and then focusing on the short trips or the, you know... Once people don't have a car, their need to drive one decreases even less. And, and bike sharing doesn't actually solve that specific problem having said that i'm a huge fan of of bike sharing and i think it's great that that brisbane has pioneered with that system but i'm sure as you all know that uh brisbane and melbourne are the only cities in the world with the mandatory helmet law um, that have a bike sharing system and the ones who used to like mexico and uh israel have gotten rid of the bike helmet laws because their bicycle share scheme was suffering so i think there's a few of those kinds of laws that are going to um inhibit or a few of those sorts of challenges that will inhibit. But other than that, in terms of the, the wider systems that are available, such as Rentoid or Airbnb or um, any of these kinds of platforms that are emerging, clothes swapping, it's all available to everybody regardless of, of geography. And I think it's about building local support, you know, starting with your street or your neighbourhood. and Because um, what's most important is the critical mass in a very defined area. You know, it's great to have a PlayStation available, but if it's on the other side of town. It's not as good as knowing what's, you know, directly available in the next three suburbs. So that kind of idea. Cool. Thank you. Ben Hamley seems the big catalyst for a lot of these opportunities that we're talking about for new social connections is communications technology. You've been closely involved in a couple of projects that have used social media to produce some pretty spectacular results. Uh, in terms of people's behaviour. One of those projects is Hello Sunday Morning, which is a program which started out as a campaign to help young people discover what life is like without a hangover. <laughs> Tell us how that works. Yeah, OK. So um, Hello Sunday Morning is a, is a very, very simple idea. Um, you just don't drink alcohol. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not as hard as you might think, um, although it does have a very challenging um, you know, first sort of value proposition when you say... It to young people. So the idea was essentially started by Chris Rain, who's the now CEO of Hello Sunday Morning, 
And in 2009, he was working on an advertising campaign for Queensland Gov uh, to prevent binge drinking. Um, and everyone in the room at the ad agency was hungover. <laughs> uh, so they had no idea what to say. How are we going to get people like us, uh, who have great jobs and probably even better social lives, to stop doing what we did last night? Because that was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> so he decided to spend an, an entire year sober um, and write a blog about that experience. And over the course of that year, uh, it got a little bit of traction. It didn't get an immense support first up. Um, and the first few attempts Chris made to get people to do it as well were pretty much just palmed off um, and people just were waiting to see what happened. Uh, it wasn't until the end of 2009 that it started to pick up. I was uh, good friends with Chris at the time. I decided to do a six-month HSM myself and then a few of my friends decided to do it as well. And it snowballed from that small groundswell of maybe five to ten people in the first year to an online active blogging community of over 2,100 people. Um, so the Hello Sunday Morning website now has 2,197 bloggers mm -hmm. today um, and a content of writing about people's experiences while sober of over a million words, um, which is gigantic when you think about just a blogging community in general. If you think about any website or any blog that you might subscribe to, I don't think that the order of magnitude of active bloggers on that would even be approaching 100, let alone over 2,000 already. Um, and when you couple that with the fact that what we're actually addressing here is a cultural shift, the, the power of those words are more than just a blog. The power of those words are permanent uh, markers on people's lives as they've attempted to do something which is incredibly socially challenging and do it successfully in, and in a few cases unsuccessfully but embrace that and as that story is shared the uh, expectation that going sober isn't necessarily as strange as you know being a vegetarian <laughs> begins to grow uh, and, and that's I guess the area that we play in and over the last year we've been doing a, a fairly extensive um, evaluation on HSM to see one does it work and what does work mean? Um, are we actually reducing alcohol consumption? Are we changing the attitude towards alcohol? Are we improving people's quality of life? Are we making people less depressed? What is actually happening and how is that happening? And now how can we apply what we've learned in that space to change of culture generally or change of behaviour um, more broadly? So looking at what those uh, weak signals are, or those markers are for changing behaviour and I think um, that's where it starts to get really interesting because when you can start with something as common as alcohol, you can move into how do you apply that learning and that um, you know, sort of change model to other behaviours that may not necessarily be as healthy for us. So what were some of the evaluation outcomes? Yeah, well, uh, we're, we're still in the feedback process with our funder, so we're technically not releasing them yet, but... But you can tell us. Yeah, I can tell you guys, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the, the good news is it works. Um, <laughs> but what we have found is within the, the population of people who do it, there is a change in the actual qualitative uh, reflections that people have over time. Um, we did we used Leximan, so I don't know anyone here who's a researcher who works at uni may have used it. It's a natural language uh, analytics tool, so it picks up key words within sentences and, and extrapolates out what those themes are that people are actually writing about. Mm -hmm. And we saw that over the course of a HSM, uh, which is someone's um, period of sobriety, and there are three options. People do three months, six months, or 12 months. The majority of people do three, but more people do 12 than six. So you either do a little bit or a whole year. Um, what we find is people will often start with a very... Um, I guess just general reflection on drinking culture. So the first night I went out with friends or they talk about drinking culture as if it were some um, strange ethnographic activity that they were doing in a, in a foreign world. Um, they're observing and taking field notes, I would imagine, with their glasses. <laughs> yes, yes. And then they offered me shots. Um, and so they are very drinking culture related. But then over time, as people get used to this, pe this period of time being an, a chance for them to reflect or just generally think about what they're doing and how that's affecting them. It's not about the fact that they've 
done it sober now, it actually becomes more about them reflecting critically on their life as a whole. And so in the second month, you start to see people talking more about relationships and families and um, friendships that may have changed or reorganised since this um, you know, new social choice. And then in the third month and over the third month, and it sort of stretches out over the three, the six and the 12, but after three months, it tends to be the same. They become much more almost predictive in terms of how people are analysing the culture around them and how they're um, almost writing a new... I wouldn't say rule book, but guidelines for how other people might go about doing a similar thing. So they start to form this huge body of recommendations mm -hmm. on how you might interpret the culture around mm -hmm. you or deal with it in a certain way or make it work for you. Um, so there is that big shift that happens in people's writing. Um, and that's coupled with some other really powerful results, which is actual um, consumption change. People um, tend to when they start HSM, report with uh, very high, in, in the actual hazardous level of drinking consumption. We used a, a test called the Alcohol Use Disorder Identification Test and it always started with a 17-point score, which is out of a range of 24, quite high. Um, and it drops into the moderate range on average. Some people drop back into the normal range as well. We uh, also observe people's quality of life improve. Um, in women, we actually noticed an increase of an in anxiety over the course of the HSM which is interesting and actually may lead to um, a greater understanding as to why women are drinking versus why men are drinking. And in men, we saw a much bigger decrease in the levels of depression, um, much like more than double that of women. So there are these different sort of underlying drivers or reasons that we drink um, that are, we're picking up from, from this study as well um, and drilling down on in a little bit more detail. And we're not the first to do it. There have been thousands and thousands of dollars spent on alcohol research, but the way that we're applying it is not so much on a, on a very specific um, tiny little area. We're actually looking a lot broader at the, the culture that exists around alcohol and getting people who are members of that culture to critique it for themselves mm -hmm. and then test a few other pre-existing evidence-based um, tests to see what the results are coupled with that. And we see also that people's attitudes towards alcohol change as well. So the expectation that alcohol will, drew, will reduce tension um, drops the the expectation that alcohol will lead to um, negative emotional outcomes drops as well. So okay. there's a lot of those kind of interesting things. It seems to me, in, intuitively, I guess, that you wouldn't actually, because this is largely about individual journeys and personal reflection, you didn't actually need a social media base. And yet that seems to be what's actually driven yeah. the, the reflection. Yeah, there's... um. What's, what we've really, really learned from HSM is, is more about um, behaviour change in general than it is about alcohol, um, and that's public accountability. And we're starting to see a move towards that with Google+, Plus mandating that you have your real name, with Facebook just skimming everything that you do um, so that when the new timelines come out, you'll need to be careful of when you lower your standards on the web or in, you know, whenever you just do anything. Um, there are cookies that are tracking that and, and people will need to get used to quite quickly the fact that you're not anonymous anymore. Um, and even the device-based interaction has got a shelf life um, that I think is probably within the five-year mark. I think we're moving very, very quickly towards ubiquitous information and ubiquitous computing. Um, and what we found is that HSM was driven by people deciding to do this, for one, but then um, making themselves accountable to that. So the act of actually writing a blog and saying, um, I'm spending three months sober to think about what alcohol means to me or the reason that I drink or maybe I just had a ferocious hangover and I want to think about that for a while. Um, you know, you, when you say that to someone else, then they can come back to you and, and ask you about it and that reinforces the choice in the first place. If you just decide to do it and you don't tell anyone... You can just as easily go to the bar the next Friday and have a beer and no one will notice and it will just sort of slide by the wayside. Um, and what was really powerful is that we didn't use anything new to build HSM. It was built using WordPress. It's still on WordPress. Um, and it was distributed through Facebook and it was distributed through Twitter. Um, and that is it. That's what the organisation was built on. So it didn't require any capital to start. Um, it does now. It's a fully-fledged health promotion charity. Um, which is and it's tax deductible as well for donations. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Um, 
But, uh, you know, that's not the reason I'm here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, t- you talked earlier, Ben, about um, some of the issues that, that pe- people are getting concerned about. And I guess Facebook's very top of mind at the moment. Mm. There is this real pushback, isn't there, about people being concerned about privacy uh, and information, you know, data security Skeletons and so on. Closet. Skeletons in the closet. Uh, yeah. You know, drinks at the bar. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, not just in social media, but in all the ways that we, that we share personal data. Do you see issues of privacy and information, techno- uh, information security getting in the way of some of these new initiatives? I don't think so. I think what's really important to understand about information is that everyone is struggling with it at the moment. There's, I think everyone has a, a personal story about information overload that you know, is very true for them at the moment. It could just be your email inbox. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're always struggling with how much information we have and, and where we use it. Mm-hmm. And although that whole concept of information privacy is very um, real and it's a very real fear that people experience when they think about who might have access to this data, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Um, I think what we need to start looking at now is how are we using the data and how are we putting it into context and how are other people putting it into context and what tools are available to do that. Um, because information is just... Just because it's there doesn't mean people are going to use it against you, but you do need to know how to use it, um, I guess, when you need to. I stumbled across um, a service called Proxy Dating, which is software which uses your phone location to to hook you up with other proxy daters in the area, (laughs) compares their profiles with yours, and then buzzes each of you with a photo of each other uh, and, and a short text profile. Now, when this service was launched back in 2005, one critic said you'd have to seriously believe in love against all odds and possibilities to think your future significant other has a cell phone with Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> but as I understand it, I mean, in, in just the, the few years since that, since that quote, of course, pretty much every iPhone now has Bluetooth. Almost every BlackBerry has Bluetooth. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think uh, it's called Grinder now, isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> there's a couple. That's the there's a there's Grinder, which is for homosexual um, meetups. Right. It's a location-based um, hookup tool, basically. And the makers of that realise the potential of it and have moved into the heterosexual market as well. I think it's called Fluffer, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is essentially exactly the same service. Yeah. Um, mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because digital technology is frequently uh, criticised as being an alienating technology. Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of commentary about the fact that it's something that prevents us from building um, personal connections. But you look at the results of Hello Sunday Morning. Also, another project that you've been involved in, with, which was Flood Aid, um, earlier this year when, when we had the, the flood events in Brisbane, um, they paint a very different picture of the potential of social media for connecting people. Definitely. So um, for those of you who don't know uh, what flood aid was, flood aid was a response to the floods that happened in Queensland and it was built um, off the back of a tweet Uh, because essentially when we knew the floods were going to be coming through Brisbane, um, there was a a really fast rush for the flood maps to see where it was actually predicted the water would rise to. And as soon as people discovered where they were, hosted on the Brisbane City Council website, the website crashed because everyone went there. And so mirrors started to pop up, and the um, original <coughs> concept of flood aid was simply to make those flood, ap- uh, uh, sorry, those flood maps more available to people. And that quickly evolved into, well, what is the point of just giving that information to them? How can we actually uh, help them in a, in a much more meaningful way? So what flood aid eventually became was a very simple website for people who could help to connect with people who needed help. That was it. Um, and it was built in 48 hours off the back of a single tweet. Someone um, wrote out, looking to develop a website to help people in the floods. Can anyone help? Over 500 offers of help came in within the first five hours, I think. And we had a development team of 20 working from Sydney, Melbourne, overseas, someone in San Francisco, someone in New Zealand. Um, and the website was fully launched and, and running within 48 hours by the Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, within the first week, we had 1,200 users on the site and over 100,000 transactions. Uh, so people posting it in within you know five general categories: um, you know general help, shelter, food, tools, um, or transport. And you could post, "I have a car. I'm in Annerley. Um, available." And someone could post, "I need to get out of Annerley." 
need a car and you could just connect. Um, and that was essentially the, the, the key premise. And what we observed also during the same time was a lot of people were keen to help. And a lot of people were just getting out on the street and helping. Um, and a lot of people were looking to the councils for where they could go to volunteer. The council were running volunteering services, but they were asking people to meet up at the, tra- at the evacuation centres, do a safety induction, be briefed on where they were going, get back on a bus, wait for the bus to get through the traffic, and then probably end up back in the street that they just left um, five hours later to start helping out their next-door neighbour. Um, but what Flood Aid enabled people to do was say, where am I now? Who needs my help within the area that I can walk to and go and help them immediately? So micro-volunteering, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's essentially what Flood Aid was. Um, and that's about it, really. OK, thanks. <laughs> We've been talking of digital technology in this case, I guess, as if it's purely a social benefit. Uh, and, in fact, some of the criticism of the National Broadband Network uh, has been that it will provide public subsidies for teenagers to waste time on Twitter. Hmm. Um, but, Craig Rispin, the opportunities uh, for us finding new ways to work and to balance our work and our personal lives, they're going to be of enormous benefit to business as well, presumably. Yes, and, of course, if uh, you're been a member of the futurist community for as long as I have been, it's the future that we all imagined decades ago is finally here. Mm -hmm. So I became a futurist through a chance meeting. I met Arthur C. Clarke, who is the inventor of the communication satellite that we're all benefiting from now when I was 10 years old. And he gave me advice at that young age that the future was going to be about paradox that cities were going to be about paradox, that communication technology was going to be about paradox, and if you're going to be able to succeed, survive in the future, you have to deal with this paradox. And this is what I've been hearing on the panel so far. Uh, All of these technologies can be used for good, and they can also be used for evil. They can benefit mankind, or they can be the biggest time sucker ever invented (laughs) in human history. (laughs) There were uh, many millions millions of hours sucked up by Pac-Man when it was put on the Google uh, front page. So there's great examples of that. And especially within the the business world that I work in primarily, I've seen this big shift just in the last 12 months you know, chief executives were asking me, how do I block Facebook? How do I stop Twitter? How do I um, get them off LinkedIn looking for new jobs? To <laughs> How do I get them to engage with our customers, uh, their, their colleagues? Uh, how can I create a, uh, a social network within my organization and connect out there to the community? And that's just in the last 12 months. Yeah. Okay. And the, uh, the barriers for employees to have to be told you have to go to this place to actually get work done uh, have all been completely eliminated. So uh, one of my customers last week announced that they were going to take 6,700 office workers and tell them they no longer have a desk. Mm -hmm. You may have heard about this. It was just happened in Sydney down at what used to be uh, Sega Interactive World down at Darling Harbour is uh, where one of the largest employers in Australia is starting this uh, major movement where some people are elated, they can't wait for the chance to uh, not have to work next to that annoying person that they've been stuck with for years. (laughs) And some are scared senseless. Uh, But it's a really interesting thing because uh, uh, this employer, Big Bank, uh, well, they have 8,000 8, staff in the city, but they've only allowed for 6,000 desks. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so what kinds of things are they, what opportunities are they giving staff to work in different ways? Well, um, imagine if you would walk up to uh, 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 a concierge desk rather than a receptionist, and uh, they would know from your ID tag who you are, what your affinity groups are, what skills you have to offer, uh, what you're in need of, and they would suggest a particular area that you would work with in the building rather than say, uh, you're on the marketing team, you work on that side, you're in the legal team, you work over there, you're in management, you work over there. So uh, it's uh, the, the concept that they're, uh, what they're calling it 
is uh, Centers for Excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, this all goes back to the old idea that's been around for decades that we in the futurist community have been talking about, hot desking, mm -hmm. which was, yes. became popular when, uh, when the local area network allowed us to log in anywhere within a business and take our files with us. Well, we're talking about you know, 25 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Now we can be anywhere in the world and uh, have our smartphone with us and uh, connect to people that uh, have something we need or, uh, or offer something that we have. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, transforming the way that people work. A lot of the prof professional services organisations picked up on the hot desking uh, idea long before others, but it, we, we again seem to have been quite slow in some areas in taking this on and moving on with it. What do you think yes. has been getting in the way of it? Um, mindset. Yeah. Mindset. There's something, so about, something about owning Ben it. was talking about mindset. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren was talking about mindset. Rolf was ta talking about mindset. It's, uh, I mean, just the shift in generating your own energy or in Sydney, you know, it was against the law for us to have to collect rainwater from our roofs until recently. Mm. I mean, that was, uh, I could, just couldn't believe it. I, what do you mean I can't have a water tank on the side of my house? That's free stuff. You, you regulate the stuff that comes out of the sky? I didn't know that was <laughs> part of the Australian Constitution when I <laughs> moved here. Uh, there's a big, big um, uh, mindset shift that one has to go through. And imagine the numbers of investment review committee meetings they had to have in this major bank before they invested in this brand new building where there weren't permanent desks. How many meetings did they have debating whether this was going to be able, they were going to be able to continue to trade even? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, would their ATM network go down again? It might be one of the things that uh, the IT team says, no, we have to be there between these hours and working in this place. But of course, that, that's not the truth anymore. You can do, work from anywhere, anytime, with whoever you want to. And it's not just in, uh, in business or in government or other organizations. When I was thinking about this audience, uh, hands up if you work in an office building every day. Right. Uh, hands up if you really love that experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Less than 1%. So there are new ways of working, not only in the corporate space, but in the startup space, in the um, uh, collaboration space, in the networking space. Uh, even in this building here, there's a space a bit like that. Um, so if you think of the entre entrepreneur space, uh, I just went to a, a, a pitching panel where uh, startups in Silicon Valley got uh, six minutes to pitch their startup and people that could fund them up to $100 million were in the audience. And the teams that you saw coming together were, you know, a couple people up on stage, but they're saying, and our program team are, li are live, logged in right now mm -hmm. on Skype. Uh, our programming team is in Bulgaria. Our design team is in Singapore. Here's our, um, our sales and marketing team in Sydney. And they're doing a joint presentation they're a multinational at startup, mm -hmm. and it's only through these enabling technologies that they've been able to build in 48 hours a brand new startup, thousands of them, mm -hmm. and, and uh, get funded the, the next day. It's a, a spectacular thing to see. I just get goosebumps yeah. uh, talking yeah. about it. Yeah. I mean, we most commonly think of telecommuting when we think of new ways of working, but of yes. course, I mean, Ben's just given us an example of crowdsourcing, for example, mm. with, with flood aid of, mm. yes. of putting an idea out there mm. and having people volunteer to work on it. There must be other things like that that are that are oh, emerging. Oh sure, and uh, I went looking on YouTube so uh, I could make a, a suggestion uh, to the audience here. If you want to see a prediction of the future where we are today, um, my uh, a clip from my original mentor that brought me into this world of futurism, Arthur C. Clarke. And if you go to YouTube and put in Arthur C. Clarke in 1964, predicts the future, you'll see a short video clip, and he talks about how we're going to have uh, handheld computers that will give us access to the world's information that will allow us to work anywhere. So why would we drive into cities, uh, deal with traffic, if I could stay in Ipswich and uh, work from anywhere in the world. And I have to say, in, in my business, where I typically show up at big conferences 
and address uh, people live, like I'm doing here, more and more in my business, they're saying, Craig, can we put you up on the big screen? Because we don't think flying you to Hong Kong for $9,000 for a 40-minute speech <laughs> is going to be much more sustainable in the future. Uh, we, kn- we already know you, we trust you, and we just want your content. So could you, could you show up in, in a uh, Google Hangout mm-hmm. instead of uh, a fly-out to mm-hmm. Hong Kong? Yeah. And it's just starting to impact the events industry that I work in. Uh, But, you know, there's um, a a great saying um, from William Gibson that says that the future uh, is already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed. And my colleagues that are in the business that I'm in in the United States, 50% of all the presentations that they give in the event industry now are virtual Mm -hmm. rather than live. 50%. Here in Australia, it's about 2% right now. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity gap. Mm -hmm. And, of course, um, technology is allowing us to make the most of the 24 hours in a day. I mean, we've got, we've got radiologists in the UK who launch their, you know, their, their um, examination results, and, and by the time they get up in the morning, radiologists in India have you know, yes. uh, delivered, the, delivered the analysis for them. Do you see a lot of that happening here? Oh, sure. In fact, one of my clients, uh, she is the CEO of the largest scanning network here in Australia. And uh, if you and go get a scan done in Australia. Unfortunately, there is a a need for 45% more uh, 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 radiologists to read those scans. So there's, uh, we need more more employees to fill these positions, and they're just not available in Australia. The skills haven't been uh, developed. Mm -hmm. So overnight, they get shipped to to India, they go to Malaysia, they go to uh, Singapore, they go to America, they go to the UK. And so if you go and get a scan done in, in Australia today, she tells me, 50% chance it's being read by someone overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, you saw that when you signed the disclosure, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we're in an, in a, in an, uh, an economic environment where we have uh, businesses and politicians so frequently talking about skill shortages, yes. presumably there is an element of creativity lacking here because if we were just a little bit smarter about the skills that we were needing and were able to adapt our systems in our workplaces to take advantage of of skills elsewhere, we'd maybe ameliorate some of those issues. Oh, yes. And so um, uh, there's a futurist who's uh, uh, by the name of Thomas Frey who was most recently at IBM and he has the most number of patents and awards uh, to his name of, of any IBM engineer. And he's running projects with countries right now saying, uh, how soon do we get to 50% unemployment? Mm-hmm. And basically he's saying that 50% of jobs will be eliminated through uh, new emerging technology. Mm-hmm. And uh, can we predict which ones are going to be and which ones are going to be sustainable? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a great discussion to have as a country, as a state, as a local community. But uh, I've, I've done, been doing a bit of work in education lately with independent schools here in Queensland and in uh, New South Wales and in Victoria. And I can tell you that right now educators are starting to figure out that what they're teaching might not be required in the future. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit scary that they're only just working that out, though. Because I, you know, I th- I'm trying I've to be nice. Hearing- <laughs> well, I'm sure it's true of, of educators, not just in, in Queensland, but I, you know, we've been hearing for a decade now that jobs that are emerging now weren't even thought of you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Yes, and jobs that were at the top of uh, the... Uh, well, I'll give you one industry that I do a lot of work in, IT industry. And uh, I was thinking about a top-paying job five years ago would be a SAP enterprise consultant, right? We're talking about a very senior role. You'd probably worked five years in this area, and we're making close to $200,000 a year easily. That's an entry-level position today. Mm-hmm. And that's just in five years. Mm-hmm. So the, the world moves very, very quickly, and especially in the IT industry. You, you tend to see it first because the people that work in the IT industry uh, take these technologies on first, and then it spreads throughout the greater community. Mm-hmm. And so j- an example of that are these startups where uh, they don't have computers um, back at headquarters somewhere. They open up a, uh, a, an account on, on Amazon, who's the biggest cloud hosting company in the world. Who would ever thought that a bookseller <laughs> would become the biggest, uh, one of the biggest IT companies in the world? And uh, within 48 hours, they've deployed a brand new uh, organization. I mean, it's, 
It's just spectacular. But of course, if you watch that video from uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke in 1964, where exactly, mm-hmm. where uh, not just Arthur, but the, uh, the tens of thousands of members of the World Future Society said, we, we, we were going to be, has just turned up. Mm-hmm. So if I could channel um, Kevin Kelly for a moment, who uh, talks about to be able to understand the future, you have to throw your mind back. Mm-hmm. Could I ask you all just to think for a moment? We're in 2011, right? Think back. Can you remember 2001? Can you remember? What was happening in 2001? Can you remember that? It wasn't that long ago. It was the end of the tech bubble, the first big tech bubble that we had. If you went back uh, 10 years before that, 1991, can you remember what was happening in 1991? We didn't have the web, (laughs) right? We didn't have the web. Google wasn't around. We didn't have local area networks, probably, in most of your places. You didn't have coax, you know, fax machines. (laughs) So just for a minute, thinking back, that was a 10-year jump and then another 10-year jump. Throw your mind forward 10 years from now, and where are we going to be? So just think about one, one thing that we can predict here in this country, regardless of what side you're on. Uh, ten years from now, we will probably had seven years of uh, incredible bandwidth straight to our home. And how different will that make the role of work where I can broad my, broadcast myself in high definition to any place in the world? Um, and it has some great benefits. I don't have to get on a plane and fly 15 hours to Philadelphia, but also I have to get up at 3 a.m., and be available to deliver that speech. Yeah. So it, uh, it's a great opportunity, and it's also a great threat to, uh, you know, uh, my health <laughs> and lifestyle. <laughs> In the late 80s, there was a lot of talk about us entering the new age of leisure, and, you know, that the, there was going to be much more part-time work and, and, uh, as a result of new technology. But yes. it hasn't really worked out that way, has it? In fact, the line between working and not working is increasingly blurred. Yes, and that's why people are making how happy they are at work an increasing priority. Mm -hmm. They're deciding whether they can take a a day off work or not and work from home. Can they negotiate, renegotiate their contract with their their employers? Uh, And if I can't, maybe I'll go somewhere else. And in an environment that we are in Australia, as opposed to the rest of the world, where when I went to school and I took Economics 101, 6% was full employment. We're at 5%. I know at this major employer that I'm working with down at Darling Park, uh, they got 5% of their employees that don't turn up every day. (laughs) They just don't turn up because they've got flu or they got a cold or they got to take care of a a family member. That's just uh, their that's their unemployment for the day. (laughs) So they're at full employment, 95%, and so are we as a country. uh, Today, so people are saying, "Well, I could leave leave this and go somewhere else." So. Um, John Nesbitt, a a futurist who wrote a best-selling book in 1984 uh, called Megatrends, identified exactly what we've been uh, talking about here. As technology invades our lives more and more, think Facebook for a moment, that we'll go back to uh, uh, from the high touch to the high tech. And this is the paradox of the future. Uh, We're probably not going to give up the technology because it's going to give us so much benefit to the way that we work, the way that we consume, the way that we can share. But we're probably going to go back to sourcing local food, uh, valuing personal relationships more than online relationships. It was, you know, this this, the place that we're in right now was predicted in 1984. Mm. Here we are with today. (laughs) There's a really great quote that I read recently um, by Francis Gell, who is the assistant to Thomas Edison, um, that says, Thomas Edison is actually a collective noun, which means the work of many men. And there are examples of that many, many times in history. Even Monet operated an art factory where he had um, budding artists and painters who would come in and learn works from great masters or just learn to paint in general. And they would do most of the work and then he would sign on the end and do the little eyes because the eyes are difficult. And we've, we've, now, we've now come into this, um, this period of great collaboration where we're really, really excited about collaboration but we have this creative conception 
that's incredibly romantic, where we believe that artists need to be these lone individuals with a, just the right amount of mental illness. And <laughs> <laughs> when in actual fact, when you look at the, um, the greatest producing people or artists or creative individuals in any field, their highest, their highest rate of production, when they are the most productive, is when their most important works are done. And it's the same with collaboration. When we are doing the most, when we are accessing the most and we are actually breaking down those individual barriers and saying, it's okay if I don't own this, it's okay if you have this piece of information, I'll help you do this, I'll work on this project and then tomorrow I'll go to the, 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 the desk and be assigned to something else. Mm. If we can enable that kind of activity mm. fast enough so that it happens quickly and, and successfully, we will have the most significant works created. So if you think about office, yeah. that's one mode, but in the startup, collaboration, uh, sharing, uh, the, what I call the maker community, uh, one of the spaces that uh, I've been involved with for well, a number of years now, the, the labeling term for it is called co-working. Have you heard of mm-hmm. this? Yeah. So there's a few co-working uh, uh, spots around here in, uh, in Brisbane. And I'm working on one that is, uh, we're recycling an old boat shed, a massive boat shed. They used to build these power cruisers, and uh, they moved up north. So we're taking 1,600 square meters and, move, and converting it into, uh, will be Australia's and one of the largest in the world, co-working space for, um, for makers, inventors, for collaborators, for... Uh, people who uh, want to create the next startup. Mm. And if I was going to make a prediction for the future, right now there's about uh, 200,000 people in the world that show up to a co-working place instead of working from home because uh, the motto for the co-working community is uh, don't work alone, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but don't go to the office, right? Go to a, this third place and it's probably not Starbucks. Mm-hmm. It's one of this where you share a printer, mm-hmm. you share the Wi-Fi, you share the coffee machine, mm-hmm. And uh, serendipity happens across the table rather than through Facebook and say, hey, you're a graphic designer and I'm a programmer and I've got a client project. Maybe we can collaborate. And it's when you're eye to eye, toe to toe, uh, these sorts of things uh, happen, not just, not just through uh, Twitter, Facebook and, and blogging. Yeah. Mm. I wonder how many of you um, are aware that you've probably, probably been part of a global digital transcription service. You know when you, uh, when you fill out a web form oh, yeah. uh, and you've got a security measure that it requires you to, to type in uh, some weird numbers and letters? Uh, th- these used to be, when they first set up that, that technology, they were randomly se- selected. These days, um, they tend to be words that are taken out of ancient scripts, um, ancient texts that need to be uh, transcribed and preserved. And so every time you fill in one of those web logs and, and you're actually taking part in a global transcription mm. exercise, which is capturing and preserving ancient digital texts, yeah. I just think it's a... With, without even realising that you're doing yes. that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, just a, quite a remarkable kind of a project. Yes. Yes. I still haven't figured out how to do that with the A and the E on the same letter. <laughs> so if Refresh. that ever comes up... No. Refresh. <laughs> <laughs> It's an amazing technology, you know, invented by a, by, by a futurist by the name of Ray Kurzweil, invented optical character recognition, and now it's being applied to uh, forms. But uh, you probably don't want me to tell you that um, on top of this, in terms of touching on the privacy issue, uh, there are satellite receiving stations in Australia that are transcribing every phone call you ever make. <laughs> Yeah. Right. <laughs> you think I'm making this up? No, I you? do not. <laughs> and uh, and it's part of our treaty with America. It's being sent overseas. Great. You didn't see that part of our constitution? <laughs> didn't yeah. see that part. Next to the water tank. <laughs> there can be some interesting uh, and positive, if unintended, consequences in in how we introduce technology. And Ben, you were telling me a story about an example in India. Yeah. Recently. That's right. Um, in, in the work that I do, um, I work quite closely with a lab at QT called Urban Informatics, and the majority of their research revolves around um, information within urban environments and how that's used. And uh, one of the research projects that they w- had been working on recently involved the collection of um, carbon dioxide 
from a, a city, I think it was in India, it may have been somewhere else, but what they did is they put little CO2 metres on top of the taxis mm. because they couldn't figure out where the best places to measure it were and they didn't want to just have one signpost that was measuring the whole thing because that wouldn't be indicative of the city. So the taxis are always driving around, they'll get a pretty accurate picture of where it all is. The data started coming back in and they started to see this trend and after a couple of weeks the data trends started to change and they thought okay, something weird is going on here. We met, we, they went back to the taxis and they asked the guys, so have you changed anything? Is it broken? Um, have you been covering it up? They hadn't actually done a full induction with the taxi drivers as to what this little box on top of the, on the cab was actually doing, but they said, it's a research project. We're gathering inf- environmental information. You'll help us out. And what they discovered was the taxi drivers were meeting up at the ranks and talking to each other about this little box on top of the car and going, what do the numbers mean? Like, do you think that this one means more, this one means less? What is the beep? What, how frequently does it flash on yours? And what they discovered is that, in fact, they were measuring you know, the environmental factors and so they figured it must have been carbon dioxide, and, among other things. And so they decided that our cab um, passengers are probably not going to enjoy driving long polluted routes. So they changed the routes that they took to be, le- to be more environmentally friendly and therefore more enjoyable for their passengers and that would probably improve the, uh, the turnover that they made in the cab. And so that's a really powerful example of when you provide just enough information but you also provide that layer of context for people so that they understand what this information means, behaviour will change like that. It doesn't mean you need to push um, and so much now we've, we've tried mass awareness campaigns, we've tried to, to just tell and push, and really what you just need to do is give people an opportunity and empower them to do it for themselves, uh, and, and they'll do it. It's like that yeah. feedback loops is the same as with the Prius, having yeah. that energetic, en- energy information within the dashboard made people's driving behaviours change yeah. just by seeing you know, how the energy consumption was fluctuating it's as well. It's fun theory as well, making people walk upstairs just by painting them like a piano. <laughs> and, and then everyone wants to walk up and down the piano stairs. <laughs> Over to your audience for questions. Uh, if you have a question, could you please raise your hand? And please, this is really important, if you can wait for the microphone to get to you before you ask your question. And the We're reason for that is... That re- <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry? We're transcribing. We're transcribing. We are, in fact, recording uh, for a podcast so that we can make this available um, after this evening as well. So please wait for the microphone. Um, And please also make the most of the expertise that you've got on the panel tonight, uh, as well as respecting other people in the audience. And uh, so we're looking for succinct questions uh, (laughs) rather than long statements. Mm -hmm. Anybody got a question? I've got a succinct question, Karen. Just just a moment, Mary. We'll just get the microphone down to you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just Mary. I'm wondering what will happen to all the high-rise office buildings that we have when um, workforces become more decentralised. Perhaps they might be converted to residential accommodation. Um, that, that's one question that arises. And I'm also a bit concerned about um, employment. And will there be, as some jobs disappear, will there be enough other jobs provided that will enable people to earn income, to pay income tax, to provide all those funds that governments need uh, to run a, uh, a modern economy and society? Great questions. Thanks. Craig, do you want to pick that one up first? Sure. Uh, f- let's take the first one. What are we going to do with all these office towers they're building that they can't lease out? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed there have been a lot of uh, there's lots of empty buildings around the place Uh, just driving down the uh, Gold Coast Highway the other day how many uh, places that I knew were filled for years with restaurants bars and other things are just plain empty what are they going to do with them and if they're not sustainable for bars or uh, for restaurants what other use could it have so there are uh, there's a uh, organization that thinks about this every day. So I might give you a, a, a source of further reading. So you know how there's doctors without borders? There are architects without borders. And they talk about what the future of cities are going to be and uh, what can we do to transform uh, uh, one business model into another. So uh, property developers, and I have many of them as clients, some of the are the biggest property developers in Australia, are starting to figure out that the premium price that they got for premium office space 
in major capitals might not be a sustainable business model. And they're look, the primary way that they're pitching it to their uh, investors and clients are mixed, flexible use. <laughs> because we can no longer predict in the 25-year use case of this building that we're putting up that what it was originally de designed for will be ultimately used for 25 years later. So uh, this so is... potentially you could see offices in the city particularly becoming uh, residential because, of course, uh, in, in Queensland... Uh, we've been looking at this issue of increasing the density of our cities uh, from a transport perspective, from an energy perspective. Um, perhaps sure. that's one of the one of the options. Yes, and you can see it happening uh, around the world. Uh, Westfield now, an Australian company, owns 30% of all the retail uh, shopping space in North America. Did you know that? And uh, with the economic downturn that's uh, happened uh, in America, which is significantly, retail has been significantly impacted on an order of magnitude greater in, Aus in America than Australia, they're taking these shopping malls and they're turning them into co-working areas. They're taking what used to be shops and turning them into little offices for startups. And, uh, you know, when they built the shopping mall, all they thought was going to be a shopping mall. But imagine if the Westfield became your city that you went to to get your job done. You've got all your local... Um, uh, shopping there, you've got access to services, and maybe your office is there as well. And uh, probably the biggest thing is uh, lots of parking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> actually, to take that one step further, you could actually retrofit the shopping centres to uh, probably have mixed use development, actually have accommodation or have your, your, uh, your accommodation and your, your living there as well. Mm -hmm. So rather than using a shopping centre, but uh, 30% of the time, you'd actually turn it over mm. 24 hours, so you, you don't have the issues with security security, and all that sort of business. Mm. Mm. Entertainment all contained in the one package. Yeah, there's mm. been this idea that there's this you know, problem with scarcity and we don't have enough and that's why we build more office towers, but really the problem is that we have this abundance of stuff but no easy way to figure out where this abundance is needed. And there, are, you know, there might not be offices looking for this space, but there are so many people who, who need the space to do whatever it might be. And there's a, a great program in the UK called called Somewhere Too, which is basically addressing the problem that young people don't have places to, to recreate, to hang out. You know, they're choosing the shopping malls to hang out or they're, you know, causing mischief somewhere or whatever, or hanging out at the kids' playground because there's no space that suits them. And Somewhere Too is actually looking at these spaces that exist within the community, whether it's a, you know, a tennis court that belongs to a school but isn't used after hours by the community or, or something private or an office space that's not used or a shop that's, you know, closed after hours and thinking about how these kids can actually access these spaces to, to collaborate on whatever they want to do and making those matches. And the internet obviously obviously makes that possible. And I think the, the information's out there as to what these spaces could be, uh, but it's about matching matching those needs. And, and just on the question about uh, the employment side of things, probably something that I haven't talked about with collaborative consumption yet is this capacity for people to become micro-entrepreneurs. And these platforms are actually enabling people to earn you know, varying degrees of, varying sums of money depending on, on their level of interaction with them. But something like Airbnb, uh, people in New York are actually making up to $5,000 a month by subletting their apartment or, you know, renting their apartment out to, to people who are visiting the city. And and there's another platform called TaskRabbit, which is basically outsourcing odd jobs that you don't have the capacity, time or skill to do, whether it's picking up your dry cleaning or your dog food or having somebody assemble your IKEA furniture, which is something that's actually posted like six times per hour. And so people are actually building these specialties in these in these uh, areas, whether it's IKEA, you know, because IKEA is fun. And if somebody actually really wanted to do that, day in and day out, but not have this, come, you know, be working for a lab labour company, they can actually earn, you know, $3,000 a month if they took on these tasks, uh, fitted in with their normal lives or their, you know, their normal habits. I'm going to the shops here, so I'll see who's looking for something at the shops and I can make $20 that pays for my petrol to get to the shops. You know, those kinds of things. Again, it's, it's this reallocation of the assets that we have. Somebody's time isn't being used to the maximum capacity and, and these platforms are enabling that to yeah. happen. There's an interesting concept that's starting off here in Australia now called Landshare mm. where it's a collaborative consumption yeah. where you have the, the land, you, you may be older and you can't actually uh, work that land, say, yeah. in, the, in the suburbs. Yeah. Uh, whereas you've got uh, younger people out there that are, have, have got the knowledge but don't actually have the land. The so there's so there's a, a possible job there where you, you've actually got a, a young farmer mm. 
farming the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, same, say, with a lawn mowing contractor. Uh, why does everybody need a, the, a lawn mower when you could actually have somebody in the local area that doesn't need to drive everywhere uh, creating a, a lawn mowing slash composting service? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's 65,000 people in the UK that have been matched through Landshare, which is phenomenal. It has just started in the last couple of months in Australia, but they're already well over a thousand uh, matches. So you know, it's definitely growing. Fantastic. Ben, did you want to add anything? Oh, I was just thinking in terms of office space. The biggest thing I can think of at the moment is schools and education. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the things that keeps coming up with the education um, issues is the relevance of the learning and and making that something that's going to be useful once you get to the point where you're actually going to use it. Um, And these office spaces have been fitted out for multinational corporations. They've got high-speed internet, they've got desks, they've got everything pretty much there ready to go, and schools don't have that. Um, So why don't you just put those school places into those offices and then they can work side-by-side with professionals who are working and start reallocating their intelligence, like mentoring people through and actually positioning people where they're learning in the environment where they'll actually be applying rather than in this safe bubble mm. off to the side in the suburbs. Mm. Thank you. Or, or here's an idea. Do we need schools anymore? Mm. Mm. I reckon that's a two-hour question <laughs> 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 itself. Okay. Question over here, thanks. I was just thinking on that last question. Uh, perhaps conversely, kids can teach... Um, office managers how to play and how to uh, really enjoy themselves and, and yeah. make the most of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you say, that could be a two-week conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I was more thinking about um, like we, um, what Craig had said, um, and admittedly I missed the first part of the, of the session, but I'm, on the one hand we're talking about the uh, not going into central places of work, um, not having offices, um, being able to... Um, you know, work independently, if you like. But I wonder how much research has actually been done because my experience as a human resources professional is some people just want to turn up, Mm. do their bit, Mm. get their pay and go home. Mm -hmm. It is a very different type of person that either wants to do a start-up or that uh, wants to collaborate. Yes. Craig? So uh, you come from HR, so I'll give you uh, studies that are done in organizations around the world every day to give you some uh, evidence to start off with. What's the average level of, uh, a, if, you, if you're not an HR, you, or you probably heard of, engagement level within organizations? I actually give a percentage. So what do you think the average engagement level is for your um, average worker um, being employed in Australia? If you took Every employer in Australia, and you said, what's the engagement level? What percentage would you estimate do you think it is? 30? You're really generous. You're really generous. Uh, there are a lot of employers that are striving. Okay, small business is different. That's, that's a social issue, uh, sociolo- sociology issue rather than a work issue. But go, the, the average, it, uh, most people are saying, is around 20%. So in other words... 80% of people who go to their job, whatever it might be in Australia, are not engaged. I would start the research there. <laughs> just, can we just wait? No, no, no. Can we just wait for the um, microphone? That's all. Happy, happy for you to talk. But. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Just, 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 a, just a qualification on it. I heard the statistic the other day. It's actually 60% is neutral, and then there's 20% actively disengaged, mm. <laughs> making it worse. Yeah. yeah, turning up to work every day just to sabotage your business. <laughs> yes, I know who they are too. Yeah. <laughs> is there another question? Thanks. Oh, up the back. Thank you. So, sorry, I, might, I don't think the microphone worked. If, if, uh, the question is how we might be caring for older people in the future. Sorry. Um, yeah, I work in marketing within the aged care sector. And my question is um, if any of the panel members had any comments or insights into 
how we might care for older Australians in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I, with the transition town movement, uh, one of our, I suppose, steps is respect the elders. Mm -hmm. So getting them involved in um, the knowledge side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the nanotechnology rather than the nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and getting them active. Uh, my, my next door neighbour of, of 50 years is about to move to a, a uh, retirement village, but They've got the full workshop set up. They've got an indoor swimming pool. They have the, the bus trips where they don't actually need a car to take them to the shopping centres. Um, that, for me, is a fantastic way for to, to launch yourself into retirement and, and still be active. Mm. In saying that, it's still very you know, it's still very isolated. Uh, they're, they're down at Redland Bayway. So that, to me, there needs to be a, a bit more of a model how you actually integrate that particular concept in across a whole range of generations. Yeah, I'm particularly passionate about this. My fiancé's mother actually works quite heavily in aged care and in Alzheimer's research. And um, just in the way um, facilities are designed for elderly people as well mm -hmm. as how they're used. And the, the case you just made there is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about human rights in you know, sort of the refugee um, scenarios, um, where we really need to be looking at human rights issues is in aged care facilities and Go and, go and look at one in your local area. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very serious issue. Mm -hmm. um, there is nowhere near the kind of resourcing that's required just to maintain these kind of places, mm -hmm. let alone make them places that will be enjoyable or have any degree that we believe is even basic quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, it is atrocious. Mm -hmm. But without getting into a, a bit of a rant, um, I, I really do think that it is an area that needs a lot of um, almost a youthful approach because for me right now it's an area that I want to get into as, as an entrepreneur is I would like to design a place that I would like to retire at and what are the facilities that we need but how do we design those facilities that are um, going to be usable and, and actually going to you know, be able to accommodate people in a way that they can work within them because we know that as we age that we can't do things in the same way as we used to and we need to we need to take account of that. So, um, I don't know if it's so much of an answer that I have, but as there's definite passion here. So, <laughs> there's some there's some really interesting things again it. happening in the UK, and and perhaps you know it's, it's the start of something, but you can see the opportunities. Like something like Landshare, actually, um, you know, creating garden plots within the facilities of aged care homes. Um, there's uh, one example where you know they had the local school come and garden on this on this property, and I think the idea of mixed use. And, and, you know, not isolating them in a particular area but actually having that kind of level of engagement in the community and having a, you know, a start-up lab in amongst, you know, an aged care facility or something like that and really um, changing it up. And, again, uh, something like The Good Gym, which is a, a platform where... Well, the founder of The Good Gym basically thought that gyms were a symptom of a really sick society because we have to go to this room and, you know, churn all this energy which goes nowhere. Mm. And he also had this desire to do something, you know, that was a little bit more meaningful with his time. And, you know, combining the two, you get both done um, during the week. And he basically partnered with a place called Tower Hamlets in the UK where people who are looking for the motivation to do running and, um, you know, perhaps something a little bit more than just you're going to lose weight can actually be paired with somebody who's called a coach in this in this region, Tower Hamlets, um, who's, I think, it's, I think it is an aged care facility. Um, and that coach then is the motivation that makes this person do their run every day to bring them the paper, uh, have a cup of tea, have a chat. And, and that's actually, you know, when it's raining or terrible outside, and you can't ring Bill and say, I'm not coming, because he's going to give you what for, and you're going to get there and give him his paper because he really wants to read it. And mm. that kind of social motivation or peer, mm. peer pressure um, and, the, and the storytelling side of things, actually, you know, there's so much opportunity to bring the two together, yeah. but in really unlikely um, combinations, yeah. I think. There are technology um, aspects as well yeah. to this, aren't there? Absolutely. You know, in increasingly, technology is going to allow people, uh, the elderly, yeah. to stay in their own environments mm. more safely. Mm. Um, you know, we're, they're talking about fridges that, that can alert family members yep. if they haven't been opened in, a, right. in a day or two. Pill so bottles that glow if they haven't yes. been taken that day, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff. And that yeah. technology is already in place yeah. today. Yeah. It's old. So, um, there's a uh, Intel has a, uh, an in-house futurist on healthcare technology. Mm -hmm. So if you Google Intel and uh, future of healthcare, they have passive monitoring. Mm -hmm. So uh, rather than uh, a video monitor for elder care, 
uh, it's infrared on the floor, mm -hmm. and they can tell when they get up, when they go to the toilet, mm -hmm. are they feeding themselves, mm -hmm. can have remote communication with them. And this is one of the reasons that the government has been advocating the MBN, mm -hmm. is that you can go to um, uh, uh, most aged care facilities mm -hmm. in Australia, and they don't even have dial-up connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bernard Salt was speaking at the Aged Care Conference. Uh, you can get his speech from, the age, uh, from Hobart last year. And he was talking about that, uh, you know, you are all going to be the people that are going into these facilities in the future. You are not going to say, I'm giving up my iPhone at the front door. Yeah. You just, it's not going to work that way. <laughs> and if we're talking about 10 years from now, it won't be the iPhone. It'll be the embedded technology you have in your, uh, you know, behind your ear or in your chest or you ingested that's reporting to uh, your loved ones, mm -hmm. to your doctors, to your care team mm -hmm. about how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you, you think that's, you think that's, you know, sci-fi future, um, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's already out there today. Mm -hmm. There's a doctor that invented a case for your iPhone that you can hold up next to your heart and it does an ECG on your heart. Mm -hmm. And my father has a pacemaker and he's feeling a w little bit weird and he's worried whether he could get on the plane or not. And he had to drive three hours to, to because he lives in the country area, three hours to his primary caregiver to check on his heart before he got on the plane. He could have just held this case up to his heart, transmitted it to his doctor, uh, but, you know, the FDA hasn't appro approved it yet. Mm -hmm. so. But next year, mm -hmm. he won't have to drive three hours. He can send his vitals to his doctor anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Another question? So, G'day. I'm interested for some reflections on how each of the speakers might see personal relationships and family relationships evolving, mm -hmm. such that if you don't particularly live in a place, nor eat at a place, nor cook at a place, or garden at a place, get some loving at a place, or uh, with uh, technology you have to work in a particular place, well, what, how might that affect the relationships we now label as couples and families? Uh, who wants it? Mm. Well, I, th I think, um, you know, I think it's people, there is this belief that we're turning into, you know, disconnected cyborgs. I think that this is where you're going with your question. If, if we're not governed by where we're supposed to be at any particular time, how will our relationships be affected by that? That's sort of just, just, yeah. So I think, well, something like Meetup, um, which has ever, is everyone familiar with the platform Meetup? No. Okay, so Meetup is a platform which basically enables you to set up a meet a meetup about anything and everything. So there's um, interest groups from gardening to knitting to co-working to anything under the sun. You can French speaking, whatever it might be. You can um, search for a meetup in your area about that particular topic. But basically, the founder of Meetup, Scott Heiferman, says that Meetup is about using the internet to get off the internet. And I think that with this technology, what we're being given is the opportunity to be wherever we want at any particular point in time. And we're not going to stay home just because we don't have to go to work. We're going to find um, other ways to meet and collaborate with, with like-minded people uh, and form new kinds of interests, whether it's you know gardening, you know, suddenly be freed up to do all the sorts of things that we, we think we might want to do. And the internet is really... You know, it's going to be in the background. You know, soon we won't be thinking, oh, you know, Facebook's taking over our lives. That will just be that kind of instinctive, you know, as much as the remote control is, you know, in our lives. It's just a thing that happens to let everything else kind of um, pave the way. And, yeah, so I, I think that relationships will be augmented because we'll have the capacity to connect directly to the people who are going to enrich our lives the most. Definitely. Yeah, and there's good examples like um, a place I went recently called Common Ground, mm -hmm. um, where they have a number of people who co-own that, um, that area, the self-sustaining um, sort of family unit, but there are multiple families that come and go. It's not necessarily a, a, a particular conflict of romantic interest in any way, but they are just like-minded individuals who, who sustain this place where they can live and they generate their own power, they generate their own food, um, they maintenance the house themselves, and they all live there and they sort of pay a very small share rather than... Um, paying off a whole mortgage to themselves. I think all of these possibilities are, are, are available to us and I think the biggest problem that devices have given us is that we somehow believe that people are not people when they're on the net. Mm. We're still people when we're using a device. <laughs> um, and like you said just before, um, as we approach a, a point of ubiquity, 
um, we'll start to realise that this is just enabling, yeah, mm-hmm. and we were able to connect and, and find more meaningful. Ben and I were talking before about, you know, people we've only met on Twitter and suddenly, you know, that meeting IRL, which yeah. I didn't understand, in real in life. Real life. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and the, the number of hashtag. actual... Fr- yeah, hashtag. Um, the number of actual friends that have come out of that, that process and across countries, across states, whatever it might be, you know, yeah. that capacity to, to meet people has just been, you know, incredible. Yeah. I might give you a data point and a, and a story around this. A data point that I think is scary is that now 25% of all households in Australia are single-person households. Uh, how, does this, how can you uh, discover a result of this? Look at uh, Woolworth's Metro store where they've got single-serve salads and other meals, single-serve, because there's not more than one person in the household. That's a data point that uh, why people are looking to collaborate and meet up Mm -hmm. because they maybe they don't even talk to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a story around uh, the the connection, my daughter's 14 years old, and since the age of 11, she, on a Sunday morning, she would turn on her Skype connection to her her cousin in California Mm -hmm. and leave it running all day Mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. They only see each other once a year, but they're, 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 bonded relationship, I guess is the best way to describe it, is, you know, they check out each, what, each other what they're going to wear when they go out uh, on the weekend. They play Scrabble together, but not on their iPhone, with boards in front of them mm. uh, over the Skype connection. They leave it running, and we'll be downstairs for dinner, and upstairs is Chloe going, Sabrina, come back to your room. Because the connection, the broadband connection, video and voice, has been left open all day long. And it's ch- almost, it's not quite... You can't hug each other across that connection. But I tell you what, (laughs) (laughs) the relationships that you can create uh, online uh, uh, can lead to even deeper relationships when you see each other. We've got time for two more questions. There's one down here at the front. Um, Rolf, this one's actually for you. I was wondering what role um, high-density urban housing plays as part of the transition towns and how that sort of melds with the great Australian dream of suburban home ownership. I suppose it depends on your definition of high-density housing. Um, I mean, anything above three storeys would normally need to be made out of concrete, steel, all that sort of business, which is highly energy-intensive and it's a, it's a um, finite resource. Uh, whereas you could actually infill a lot better um, over three, sto- uh, three two, three storeys. I think it's Barcelona. Uh, it's got one of the highest densities uh, in, the, in Europe. Nothing's above about four or five mm-hmm. storeys over there. So, um, yeah, as far as the, the high-rise, say, proposed for, for West End, uh, I don't like the idea of that. It's the, a bit of a social disconnect. Uh, there's always promises about... You know, creating green spaces when you, you build one of these things, but they, in effect, never actually happened. You got all the, the shadowing effects, which affect food growing areas and and people's need for for sunlight, a, a basic necessity. So uh, I don't like that concept of that sort of a high rise. I prefer more the the infilling where it, it may be limited to to, to three stories, uh, which you, you know, in the, in the event of a, a power shortage, mm. which may happen down the track, um, you're not going to have to walk your, your seven, eight sets of stairs. Um, and the, the idea of um, needing all these lift core wells, mm. uh, which is a, a massive um, imposition and a massive resource, uh, you, you don't need that. Um, Exercise-wise, uh, having, having them two, three stories walking up and down those stairs a couple of days, a couple of times a, a day. Uh, that that's, it might seem minute, but it's a, it could be a pretty massive concept. Um, so, yeah, and it also means not you, you'd be pretty limited to growing food as well as in that sort of environment. Um, and all those other services of, of schools, um, the impact on... Um, electricity grids, the impact on our um, ageing water infrastructure, our ageing sewage infrastructure. I don't know in the context of Brisbane whether that level of infill, high-rise density 
all those systems would actually be able to cope with it. Mm. Mm. Final question. Um, my original question was around Australian examples. Like a lot of the speakers tonight have given the key touchstone examples have been international. And I know recently we were talking about land share and the things that Rolf have brung up, uh, has brought up. Why is it that a lot of these things haven't really taken root in Brisbane? Like I've been aware of all collaborative consumption for years and a lot of these initiatives, nothing seems to really take off. Hmm. And I just want to know, beyond what we've already discussed, like we've already raised some challenges, what are some greater insights you can bring to that? Great final question. That's Thank very you. Very good question. Yeah. Well, HSM started here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> HSM started here. Hello, Sunday morning. Not oh, High School yeah. Musical. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get that every day. <laughs> I'm going to start with Rolf. Rolf, thanks. Well, it, um, I refer to the the car as being the, uh, the 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 greatest form of what I call hypo hypo individualism, mm. so that uh, people are actually so disconnected by thinking that you know, it's necessary to have a car and to actually drive everywhere so they're not actually building those, those, those links to their neighbours even or across the road or the, the people down the, the street, um, people sitting behind, say, their, their six-foot their, their six front fences. I actually ripped down my fence and people thought it was strange. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, I think that's that, that disconnect of, of the car, of our car culture. I think, I mean, when, I, when we look at collaborative consumption, the whole of Australia has been rather slow and it's kind of funny that Rachel and I are both based here but the majority of our work is centred on Europe, uh, the USA and I've just come back from Brazil as well which is emerging as an amazing hotspot for collaborative consumption. And I think the, the main point of difference that I can see, well, culturally in Europe they're more you know, predisposed to, to kind of collaborating and sharing. Germany's got that great culture that's, uh, you know, around shared assets and things like that. But I think the problem or the, the challenge to face in Australia is this idea of risk and, and innovation. And I think mm-hmm. generally we are not prepared to have a go and see what works out. We want to know that it's going to work. And if it's not or if it's going to be a little bit hard, we probably won't even go there. And we're more happy to, you know, look at models that are being um, brought from overseas. But I think that's the, the, the message that I'd love to give about collaborative consumption is there are so many models waiting to be replicated and all it needs is somebody to start with that local local community. This isn't about uh, going national straight away. This is about going hyper-local, as, as small as you can get, and proving the model. And you're not going to be the leader of a multinational collaborative consumption company, but you're going to see great success in your area and hope that it will proliferate in these kind of... Um, local centres. So I think that the best thing we can do is, is start to, to collaborate at that local level and, mm. and try things out. And maybe from a, from a government level, um, it's about backing these kinds of you know, start-up weekends and, and things like that that are really allowing ideas to be worked on and, and great ideas to... All collaborative consumption companies have come from somebody going, God, I hate it when I have to do that. What if I could do this? And mm. that's where all these ideas have been born. So what really pisses you off? <laughs> yeah. Start there. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the other organisation I work for is a, is a youth-led um, creative agency and the work that we do is um, bringing, I guess, a young perspective to um, ordinary everyday problems and we do that in schools so we take the problems out there and we work through it there. And we were working on the um, Ideas Festival recently up mm-hmm. here as well. One of the really great examples that came out of that was uh, just an idea for how we better distribute local food and they were talking about you know where people go on everyday basis and they need food every day and they prefer fresh food mm-hmm. and markets are once you have gone to markets you tend not to go back to supermarkets mm-hmm. because they're just so much more fun you know you've got the aromas they're like five times cheaper and it's a whole experience that's sort of wrapped into that as well um, and so someone had the idea of well where do we go every day that we can do this and that was school so why don't you make the car park of a school a fresh food and veg market mm. so that when you go in the afternoon to pick up the kids, mm. you also do your shopping in the same place. Mm. Um, so things like this are happening. Mm. And I think it's it, just to echo what you said, mm. um, do something about it. Mm. That's it. That's mm. all that needs to happen is people just need to take a bit of risk. And mm. um, heuristics are very, very dangerous things. You cannot solve a, an existing problem with the same method of thinking that has created the problem. Um, You need to just change it and you need to experiment with something and you need to be prepared to fail 
And every time you fail, you'll get closer to something that works. Um, but you won't discover that if you think about the hypothetical and wait to prove it in your head because you cannot prove the model until you've seen what doesn't work. So, I think, yeah. I think mm. uh, kudos to another Brisbane example just to, is Food Connect, which is obviously mm. a great example Robert, of yeah. Yeah, Robert and, and Emma just having farmers collaborate to create fresh boxes of produce that get delivered to anybody who, who wants to opt for that kind of way of getting their groceries. Yeah. yeah thanks, Craig. Well, I get... I'm fortunate enough, and I'm fortunate enough, to fly around the world and get to see cities and their commitment to innovation. And there's been a lot of discussion about what, uh, uh, you know, which cities you can innovate in and which ones you can't. And I'll, um, I might end with something really controversial. <laughs> <laughs> the cities that I go to that are known for innovation are the ones where most of the population don't expect the government to help yeah. them at all. Yeah. We've got it too good. Mm. <laughs> and especially in America, especially in Silicon Valley, um, other startup places, uh, New York, um, uh, they just, you know, everybody that I know knows that they're never going to get Social Security. Yeah. They're never going to get a handout from the government. They just have to do it for themselves. And the level of innovation I think I see in, in uh, London, uh, the huge, huge changes happening there. Yeah. Um, in Tokyo, there's a whole new uh, leadership team coming in there. But it's, I think the leaders that are innovating are the ones who have decided to do it for themselves. Yeah, they have to. Mm. There's another really great example. Um, and just to, to point to, I guess, the, I guess the underlying trigger is in making people invest in themselves or invest in a particular new choice. Mm. A um, really great example I've seen is a, a new label, music label, that started up called My Major Company. And rather than... Um, the, biggest, the biggest single problem with music piracy is the value chain that it has. What costs thousands of dollars for a label to produce and find artists for A&R and develop and tour the artists, and then they end up selling the result of that, the song, for less than a dollar sometimes. That doesn't make any sense when you look at the value chain for that. And yet people immensely value music and they immensely you know, value the aesthetic of artists and the experience of enjoying music and they, they rip it off because if you can get it for free everywhere, of course you're going to try and get as much as you can possibly get. But the way to combat that behaviour is instead of try to limit digital rights and try and manage the amount of the product that you can access, is they've managed to make people invest in it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because you're never, ever going to steal from, steal from a company that you have shares in. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to let your friends steal from a company that you have shares in. So if you like music, you go onto this website and you can see a band who's just got an EP or they've just toured or they've just been signed, and you can say, I like that. I'll give you $100 to produce your next album. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I have $100 of shares in this band. So when they do sell their album, I make some money. Mm -hmm. So I'm benefiting, they're benefiting, and I'm never going to steal their music, and I'm never going to pirate that and send it to someone else mm -hmm. because now I'm invested in it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same within, within any kind of behaviour. As soon as you have to do it, it will change. Mm -hmm. um, so we just need to be encouraging people to invest in the things that we think are valuable or just find things that they think are valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay. going to ask each of the panellists for a closing comment and I guess um, if you would think about it in the context of um, if there is one idea that you see emerging or, or coming up at the moment uh, that you would like to see take root by 2021, what would that be? Who wants to start? Rolf? Everybody's uh, got off the, the consumption bandwagon mm. and are living much more uh, fulfilling lives. Mm. without the, the need for all this stuff. Yeah. yeah, well, to echo that, I guess it's thinking about where the opportunities are to, to form new collaborations, whether it's ride-sharing to work or, you know, lending your car out to their neighbour rather than everybody in the street owning a, a car, having, you know, that one shared vehicle or um, thinking about, you know, every time you need something, think about if there's a better place that you can actually get it and if you only need it for a day rather than the rest of your life and, and just thinking about what those opportunities are. I think um, just being more aware, being more empathetic of, of general situations and, and investing, trying to invest in other people's dreams as well as your own. My hope for the future is that for things that are really expensive right now but don't deliver a lot of value to society become devalued. Mm -hmm. And the things that deliver a lot of value to society but are not very well compensated mm -hmm. become compensated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that uh, I think there's a hope for that in the future. 
Right. Please don't all rush out. I've got a couple of things to say. But first, please, could you thank our very generous and wonderful panelists, <laughs> Rob Kirk, Lauren Anderson, and Henry and Kate Richard. Now, under two seats in the room uh, is uh, a copy of the Griffith Review, uh, Wicked Problems, Exquisite Dilemmas. If you want to have a quick feel underneath your seat, you might be lucky. And if there's a spare seat next to you, you could try that one as well. No. <laughs> It's actually just a small USB. It's not a full book. Ah. Ah, now we're going to look. <laughs> now we're going to look again. <laughs> no, it's taped. It's taped to the seat. Just All right. Yay, there's one. <laughs> if you would like to keep this conversation going, um, log on to our Facebook page tomorrow uh, where we're going to have a discussion thread open to, to pick up some of the issues. Um, we're very grateful to our Brisbane Institute partners and particularly to our innovation series partner, CSIRO, uh, as well as to the State Library of Queensland who have let us have this venue tonight. Um, on the, we didn't really cover it tonight because we got sort of tied up with other things, but the other area where I think that there is huge potential in changing the way that we live and work uh, is in the area of, of uh, energy efficiency and clean technology, smart grids and so on, smart appliances. We'll be exploring those issues more closely uh, in our Save Your Energy Forum on the 6th of December, so that's one for your calendars. Thank you to all of you for caring enough tonight about our future to turn up. <laughs> Peter Drucker said that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think we've heard some fantastic ideas tonight about how each of us uh, individually and collectively uh, can start to create that future. We look forward to talking with you more about this over the next few months. Please take care on your way home. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.